Hey guys, I'm Zach from Blue Label Labs. This is Bobby. Uh, I'm head of business development here at Blue Label Labs. Uh, we're going to run you through a presentation about voice, voice-driven apps, and what's that mean? Where is it headed? Uh, and everything to do with with voice. So that's us. Bobby is, is co-founder and, and CTO of Blue Label Labs, and I'm as head of business development in charge of all things sales, marketing, and partnership related. So in terms of agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about us. Who are we? So you know who's who's presented to you and give you some creds, and then uh, talk about why now, why is voice important at this moment, then who's leading the charge in voice generally, then what's being built, wh and how are those being created, how do you create a voice app or a skill, uh, what are the challenges that exist, and then why should you guys even care about voice or voice-driven apps, so that's what we're covering today. In terms of us, you know, so we are a, a mobile tablet, watch, TV, AR, VR, and Internet of Things agency. So we build apps for whoever needs it. It could be enterprises, it could be startups, it could be uh, agencies who come to us, large creative agencies who come to us and want help with some of their big brand clients. So that is, that is us. In terms of you know, who we are, you know, this is, this is our, our general, our motto, right? Experience keeps us curious. Through collaboration with our clients, together we, we build ideas that ignite the world. Uh, we're 36 people based here in, in New York. We're in Soho at Barrick and Houston. A full service team of designers, developers, and marketers of our clients' apps. So we built about 130 now over the course of, of six years since Bobby and his co founder founded Blue Label Labs. So uh, we're going to dive into why now? And Bobby's going to lead that effort. All right. Thanks, Zach. All right. Next slide, please. So the primary driver, or at least what I feel the primary driver over the next five, 10 years, of a voice-driven interface uh, comes down to what everybody's calling the Internet of Things. And that's just a fancy moniker that gets thrown around a lot. Um, to understand what Internet of Things are, is, we need to kind of look at where we've come from um, in terms of computing. So if we you know, hop in our time machine, head back maybe 20, 25 years, mid-90s, things are going good, Bill Clinton's president, everything's churning along. You know, we got dot-com this, dot-com that. Back then, the primary mode of interacting with a computer or information is with a, a terminal, with a, a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse. Outside of that, you know, you're in a purely analog world. That was your main digital interface. Um, that changed in the, the early 2000s, mid-2000s. We moved away from you know, a standalone computer. We came to the world of mobile. So then you know, we have the iPhone, the Android phones. Uh, and so we, were, we moved from keyboards, we moved to touch uh, on, the, on the phones. Uh, beyond that, coming into the, the teens now, we have the emergence of cloud. And so now we have these, these apps on our phones which talk to this ever-present cloud, pull and push data from there. So now computers are on our phones, computers are on our watches. Um, we've moved well past the terminal. If we look now, going into the future, the next step or the next evolution of computing is moving even further beyond uh, a, a mobile phone or a screen. It's computing becoming pervasive in our everyday lives, meaning more of the devices, more of the appliances, more of the things we interact with in our normal course of the day are becoming connected and aware of uh, information. So they're becoming web-enabled, they're becoming interactive devices that are not just dumb little you know, tools, they're actually becoming part of this mesh uh, of appliances and connected, uh, of a connected network that we're all part of. And so let's, you know, there's a lot of really easy examples of what internet things are. Uh, probably the biggest one is the, the Amazon Echo. So, you know, it's the black speaker that sits in your counter. You have a little friend named Alexa who does, you know, a lot of different things for you. You know, you can talk to her, she'll tell you a joke, she'll turn on your lights, you know, she'll read you a story. Other examples are, are like a Nest camera. So Nest produces uh, a little uh, mobile web camera, uh, which is, you can use it as a security camera, you can use it as a, a baby monitor, and what it does is it connects to your Wi-Fi network and it broadcasts uh, its signal to the cloud, and then you're able to control and view it uh, on your phone, and you can actually interact with it from there. Uh, moving past that, you have connected thermostats. That's another you know, very early Internet of Things device. Uh, another really good one that actually I just saw a few weeks ago uh, is this little uh, a ring device. So you have your doorbell. You know, you know, what's so fancy about a doorbell? But now we got Internet of Things enabled doorbells, which means you have a doorbell that's connected to your Wi-Fi. When you ring it, it, takes, it shows a video feed, takes your video, and pipes it to your phone. So you could be halfway around the world, you'll get a push notification saying, hey, somebody's at your door. And you can look at it, and you can let them in, you can talk to them. You can connect with them 
all through the internet. And so why am I talking about all these you know, interesting devices? The, if the Internet of Things is the next thing. The, the primary interface we're going to be interacting with them is through voice. You look at things like Alexa, you look at a Google Home, you look at a smart thermostat, you look at a Nest camera. They don't have keyboards. They don't have touch screens. They might have a few physical buttons. Uh, but for the most part, the way we're going to interact with them is either through a phone or a tablet, which is you know, somewhat like a hub, or we're going to interact with them through voice. Um, and that is the primary driver, or at least how I feel is the primary driver for voice-driven uh, applications, is that the more we have more connected devices, the more we move past phones and tablets and computers, the more we're going to have to learn how to interact with these things uh, in the form of voice. Next slide. The second reason, um, and that kind of leads in with Internet of Things, is that we have a greenfield opportunity here. Um, we're really in the early stages of this Internet of Things revolution. Um, if you think about the App Store, so mobile apps really came into their own in 2008. You know, when, when that started, we had all sorts of apps coming up. There was a lot of attention-grabbing apps. They're really simple, kind of dumb, but they got a lot of attention. Uh, today, the App Store has, I think, two and a half million apps. It's very hard to build an app that's able to gain attention, that's able to kind of set itself apart uh, from the rest of the, the heap. With things like the Alexa, the Google Home, the Internet of Things, we're really in the, we're, we're not even in the first inning uh, of this game. You know, we're just warming up in the bullpen. Uh, you think about Alexa uh, with the, the Amazon Marketplace. Um, one of the, you know, you build apps for the iPhone. For Alexa, you build things called skills. The, the Amazon Marketplace for skills is only, I believe, 15,000 skills so far. And so, you know, it's comparatively nothing. Um, it's only recently starting to, to take off, and we've seen a lot of adoption of actual connected devices that use voice. Um, a real interesting statistic is um, in 2010, there was only 5 million voice-driven uh, devices. So devices that use voice as the primary uh, means of interaction. In 2016, uh, it was 35 million. And so the, the proliferation of voice-enabled devices is rapidly increasing, and it's you know, largely due to um, the Echo. The Amazon Echo has really changed the game because it's, it's really you know, cracked the mainstream, and it's becoming this thing that everybody's getting, everybody's adopting. And with it, it's bringing along with it other uh, internet-connected devices. It's bringing in the Philips View uh, light bulb. It's bringing in the Nest cameras. It's bringing in the thermostats, because now we have this thing here that sits on our countertop, so we can talk to it, and we, can, we want to start plugging things into it. Uh, and so it's really becoming the next greenfield opportunity because, you know, the, uh, if you look at the marketplace right now, there's a really great opportunity to come in here, build something which isn't actually all that impressive. It could be like the iFart of Amazon skills and actually gain some attention, gain some easy marketability because people are like, hey, I've never done this before. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you're looking at traditional apps, you know, nobody, nobody cares about, you know, the, the, the farting apps. That was 2008. Where, we're well beyond that. You can't really distinguish yourself just by being there. Um, and so thinking about Internet of Things, thinking about voice-driven apps, you know, it's, it's really interesting to, to see where we're at uh, and how far it's going to go from here. Oh, the next slide, please. The next driver or the next push for voice-driven interfaces really comes down to computing power and how good they are. Um, if we hop back in our time machine, we go back to 2000, does anybody remember using something uh, called Dragon Naturally Speaking or any one of those voice-driven apps from that day? They were terrible. Like, you, you, they would promise the world and you'd use them for about five minutes. And you're like, this is, this is crap. This is not good. I don't want, and you, people got turned off. And it, the truth be told, you know, up until probably the last couple of years, voice recognition technology was not worth spending your time on because it may have been 70% accurate, it, but you know, 70% accurate sounds good on a math test, but not, not when you're trying to interact with something. You need something where you're actually able to communicate with the thing. Um, another interesting stat, uh, in 2010, uh, Mary Meeker, she's uh, an internet analyst, she's you know, a prognosticator of prognosticators when it comes to tech. She, she said, she made a statement that, you know, we'll know we're in the voice, uh, the voice-driven revolution when voice recognition technology gets to around 99% accuracy, meaning as you're speaking, you're able to translate 99% of the words into actual text. 
Uh, when she said that in 2010, we were about at 70% accuracy. So we were well below that threshold. In 2016, it was 90%. And in 2017, you know, from the latest metrics I've seen, it is 99%. And so what that means now is that the challenge, uh, the, com the, you know, the, the computing challenge of actually understanding somebody's speech and digitizing it and, and you know, getting something coherent out of it is actually there. Um, if you use your Echo, you know, it, it, my Amazon Echo blows me away with what I can say to her and how she's able to uh, pick out my words, pick out the sentences that I'm saying. And just a couple of years ago, you couldn't do that uh, because the, the technology wasn't there. And so uh, a lot of these technical challenges have melted away uh, with the latest generation of voice recognition. All right, next, next slide, please. Finally, kind of building off the last uh, thing around computing power. So if I asked you five years ago, you know, I want you to build a voice recognition app, an app that uses voice to do anything. You know, as an engineer, you know, my stomach would hurt. I'd reach for you know, a bottle of Pepto-Bismol and kind of just sigh and think, that's crazy. You know, I'm going to need a legion of PhDs. I'm going to have to build up a whole team just to, to go solve this problem. And the funny thing is, is that you know, voice recognition has gotten to like a 99% you know, accuracy. Uh, and what the, the best part about it is that all that heavy lifting is being done by other people. So when you're building an Amazon skill or a Google Home extension, you're not writing any type of logic to parse somebody's voice or to like do any of that conversion. It's given to you. you know, Amazon servers convert the, convert the speech. They hand you, you know, a statement saying, hey, the guy said this. Uh, and do something with it. So they're taking care of like, a lot of the hard work. So that, what that means is people are looking to innovate and develop skills and develop apps. You don't have to worry about you know, this really challenging problem from before of you know, cracking that voice recognition puzzle. Um, because for the large part, it, it's already been cracked for you. Uh, what that means for us is that it's a lot, it's a lot easier, um, it's a lot cheaper to, to, to start build things here. And it's, it's, it's a lot more, uh, I guess, acceptable in the sense of engineering risk, that you know, you're, not, you're not biting off something you're not going to be able to handle. Um, and so that's really making voice-driven interfaces uh, that much more accessible to people looking to, to, to build apps and build solutions. Um, and frankly, if you think about it, you know, voice in of itself is a lot more efficient of a way of interacting with something than typing it in. You know, an average person you know, might be able to type into a computer around 40 words per minute. Uh, you know, our voice recognition technology today can understand somebody speaking at around 150 words per minute. And so we have this voice, we have this ability to, to use voice, to tap into voice without having to solve like the really tough challenges and to build interesting, you know, application services that, that leverage it. And so, you know, that's what's making the, the adoption of the Echo, the adoption of a lot of these voice-driven devices that much more uh, easier. It's because you know, they're just giving us the tool set, say, go for it. Um, and for the mo most part, it works really well. All right, next slide. That's you. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So next, I wanted to chat a little bit about so who's leading the charge in all this voice stuff, generally speaking. And Bobby's touched on it already. And it, it is Amazon, and it is the Echo device, right? Uh, and there's a few major reasons why Amazon and the Echo have, have sort of nailed it out of the gate. So the first was the, the advent of, of far field microphones, right? So instead of having a microphone really close to me here, the Alexa device is across the room and yet can pick up my voice and understand what I'm saying to it. Uh, that's new technology that didn't exist a couple of years ago. So the idea that, that that's there means that the, these devices can, can work and can work well. Uh, the other reason why the, the Amazon Echo has been successful is people just love using it. Uh, when you look at stats, the average Echo owner is using Alexa three times a day, on average. And so there are plenty of people using it a whole lot more, and there's some using it less. But on average, you're talking three uses a day. The, the third main reason why Amazon and the Echo sort of nailed it was right out the gate, right when they launched, it became an app marketplace, or a skills marketplace, as they're called with the Alexa. They, they knew right from the start that if we don't allow developers to get in there and create new and interesting things, this isn't going to go anywhere. So from the gate, out the gate, they, they launched with a, a skills marketplace that developers could build into day one. Definitely helps with the, with the market penetration. 
Uh, so a couple devices. I wanted to run through what are the other devices out there other than the Alexa. Clearly there's, there is uh, the Echo Dot, which is just the small version of, of the Alexa device. You've got the, the new View, which has got the video capabilities, um, and of course all the same capabilities that Alexa has herself. Another new device that came out just last year, maybe, maybe 18 months ago max, was the Google Home. Right, this is Google's play into that same space. It does a lot of the same things. It's powered by, by Amazon and, and Google generally. Apple, a little bit late to the gate, but that's sort of the way they do things, right? They're gonna wait until the market is, is there and established before they jump in and do anything. So they came out with a HomePod uh, about nine months ago. Not even released yet, uh, but soon, soon to market. Then of course you've got the standard, standard devices that you guys all have in your pockets. You've got, you've got Siri on your iPhone. She's been around for a while now. Uh, I mean, I, I remember the evolution. I've had Macs since I was probably 12, 13 years old. And I remember my first voice controlled uh, app on the Mac when you could ask it to tell you a joke or you could ask it to do a few things. And it, it worked generally sometimes if you talked very clearly and you were right next to the microphone. Uh, but clearly Siri's, Siri's an evolution from that in everybody's pocket. There's the Amazon equivalent. They haven't given it a nice female name of any kind. It's just the Google Assistant. Uh, you call it up by saying, OK, Google, into your phone uh, or your, your Google Home device. This one, anybody know who's created this? Who's, who's Cortana? Who owns Cortana? Yeah, Microsoft. Microsoft. So little, little known, little used. Maybe Bobby uses it. Bobby's from Microsoft, no. so he might, he might <laughs> use it. But, uh, it exists, it's out there, but no, uh, no physical standalone device for it. It's more for, I assume, the, the tablets and it's not even on the tablet. I, I'm not sure who's using it, but I heard it's pretty good. <laughs> so it, it exists. It's on, it's, it's, on the it's on the Surface? It's on the Surface. Yeah. yeah. It's on the Xbox, too. Yeah. So I wanted to speak a little bit to, again, who's dominating the market? We talked about it's Amazon. This is a, a screen from the, the Skill Store. So this is where users go to add skills to, to Alexa, or they can add skills to Alexa by, by calling them up and invoking them through the device itself. But the marketplace exists, and as Bobby referenced, it's about 15,000 skills strong right now. So what is being built? Turn it back to Bobby. Talk All a right. bit about that. All right. Oh, I lost my mic. OK. So uh, I wanted to talk about a few of the apps and services that are you know, adopting voice-driven interfaces. Um, you know, some of them we've actually built. Um, as we partnered with you know, companies here to, to build these, and then one that, uh, a couple that aren't. Uh, the first one I want to touch on is PromptSmart. Um, so this is an app uh, we built in 2014, um, which what it does is it takes a teleprompter and it marries it to an iPod, iPad. And so the purpose of PromptSmart is not to just build any type of uh, teleprompter that you use with your, your finger. What it actually does is it uses your voice uh, and it listens to you and it scrolls the document as you are reading through the transcript. And so uh, Prompt Smart is, is actually pretty revolutionary and, and it's actually done quite well primarily because people are able to take their iPod, iPad, why do I keep saying iPod? iPad, uh, put it on a stand, load their document up and they're able to speak to it like you would any other teleprompter. Uh, and the way it works is that uh, Prompt Smart sits there and it listens to your voice. Uh, it converts it to text. Um, it uses a third party uh, open source uh, voice recognition system. So we didn't have to build, again, going back to the building block uh, slide, we didn't actually have to build the code that you know, digitized your voice and detected what it was. No, that was actually given to us. You know, the, the open source library did this. What we had to do is build the actual app on top of it, the logic on top of it, so that you know, we can take a stream of words, match it to the document, and adjust the scroll speed so that the current line of text that you're speaking is always in the middle. And this app was built in 2014, and the, the third-party plugin is called Open Ears. Uh, and so if we built it again, the, like, the accuracy of this thing is astonishing. Uh, I have it on my, uh, I have it on my uh, phone, so after the talk, if anybody wants to see a demo, you know, this thing actually works, and it works very well, um, which kind of blew me away, because when, when we started the project, I'm like, you know, voice recognition, you know, I, I wasn't a believer, but uh, once, we, once we built this and shipped it, uh, and actually be able to see how well it does work. Uh, it's a real, it really confirms in my head that you know, the, the voice recognition nut has been cracked, that you know, we're, at, we're at a point now where you can build really interesting stuff 
uh, that uses voice as the primary uh, interface. Next slide. The next app uh, I want to touch on is called Howl. Um, this is a, uh, an app that's going to be released in the next uh, week or so uh, on the App Store. And what, what Howl is meant to be is a Internet of Things enabled uh, home security system. So uh, think about the, the Nest camera I mentioned before. Um, think about the Alexa and the Google Home. What Howl is is a security system that plugs into uh, a, a smart camera that's connected to the Internet. It plugs into your, your Alexa, plugs into your Google Home and provides a, a home security system that you can actually invoke using your voice. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so how it consists of uh, an Amazon Echo skill, uh, a Google Home extension, uh, a Wi-Fi enabled camera, uh, as well as a Siri extension that are all controlled as a central hub from a, a mobile app. Uh, and the, you know, the canonical example of the use of how is if you're at home, you know, if you hear somebody breaking in, or if you walk into something you don't want to see, or something, you're in a dangerous situation, you're able to, to say, how, notify police, or how, uh, call, the, call the fire department, uh, or how, you know, notify my friends I'm in trouble. And your wolf pack. Your wolf pack. So yeah, it's modeled after having, you know, a wolf, and you're, you're howling for your wolf pack. Uh, and so this, this, this app's being released in the next uh, week or so, uh, and it is a, a very good example of, uh, of an Internet of Things uh, type of service. It's, it's both an app, but it's also uh, a skill. It's also an extension to Google Home and, the, and, the, uh, and Apple Siri. And I think it's a pretty good example of the types of services we're going to start seeing in the next few years that are moving beyond just being an app. That, you know, they're the types of services that are looking to, to, to break past, gain attention by being the first to market uh, or being like the first player in a lot of the uh, nascent fields in, in IoT. All right, next slide, please. Uh, another app I want to touch on is, is a, a Spanish language learning app called Solo. Uh, we, we didn't build this, I just like this app because it's, it's really cool what it does. So Solo, uh, as, as it implies, is, a, is an app you use to, to learn how to speak Spanish. Um, the interesting twist Solo does is that, you know, rather than just reading exercises and, you know, going through the, the motions of, you know, speaking Spanish phrases that it tells you, it actually listens to you. So you, 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 take the, you take the phrase, you speak it back to the app, and then the app uses voice recognition uh, to analyze what you've said and to grade you and to measure how well you're doing um, in terms of learning Spanish. And then what it does from there is it customi customizes a learning plan for you based off how well you're progressing through the lessons. And you know, the app actually works really well. It's a really, it's a really interesting take on how to learn a new language because it's not, it's not so one way where you're just reading things out and hoping you're doing well. It's actually able to interact with you through voice. Um, and again, an interesting you know, technical tidbit is that the, the voice recognition component, you know, the, that open source library, is the same one that Prompt Smart uses. Um, it's using the same underlying technology, but at the, you know, it's a totally different application. And the developers of this app you know, didn't really need to spend that much time solving the voice recognition problem. They were able to kind of just drop that in and then build uh, an app on top. And so this is a really compelling example uh, of an interesting use of voice, uh, of voice recognition. Um, and so I'm surprised not more, lang not more uh, uh, apps do this or more language learning apps do it because I think it's a really uh, innovative take. And so you know, be moving beyond apps, there's other places you know, we've seen uh, voice recognition becoming primary interfaces. Does anybody have the, the Apple AirPods, those Wi-Fi, I mean, those wireless uh, earphones? So like, there's no buttons on that thing. The way you control it is through your voice and through Siri. And so Apple's made the bet that, hey, we don't need to you know, put gestures on this thing. We don't need to put buttons on this thing. You know, you're going to just talk to it, and you're going to move the, the volume up and down. Um, and so the, the, the expansion of voice interfaces beyond just apps, the adoption by the big players of voice, is, you know, is training people to be comfortable with it. And so, you know, you know, these apps are innovative, were very innovative when they were released, but they're becoming much more accepted, and people are much more willing to try them because we're being trained now to, to, to be used to speaking to our devices and actually expect you know, something somewhat useful to come out of it. Next slide. Go ahead. Uh, in this app? Well, that's interesting. And so they. I assume that Amazon does store them somewhere. Um, so the, the voice, 
The actual skill code is hosted on Amazon's servers. Same with Google, and the, the voice recording is coming from Amazon. So, you know, I'm not sure what, what, how they retain the data or how long they do it, but I would assume that they do. And so. Sorry? You as the creator of an app cannot access? We can't access the, the past recordings. We could take the recording as, a, we could take the digital text and store that somewhere, but we don't get the actual, like, here's the wave file like that, uh, of the person. Um, but it's, an in, it's a very interesting question that I wonder what the answer is in terms of what happens to that voice file and, and how long is that kept around? Because that would have implications on privacy and the types of things people might or might not be comfortable doing uh, through a voice interface. Back to that. Cool. I want to talk a little bit about how are these being created generally. And right, this is something that we do in our shop. Um, the three, three main steps, ideate, design, and then build, measure, learn. But I want to talk a little bit about ideate. So the idea of ideation is figuring out what do you want this skill to do from the outset. Now, from a, from a planning perspective, there isn't a whole lot of a difference between the idea of creating a a script or a storyline or a path through a, a voice-driven app or skill as, as similar to a, a bot, a chat bot, right? Everybody's interacted with a chat bot at some point now, uh, somewhere. And the idea is that's a scripted dialogue, right? Somebody has to figure out what are, all the, what are all the things that could be said and how do you then respond to that prompt from the user. So it's, it's quite similar in developing a voice-driven app in this case, you're not typing in, in a chat window, but you're instead speaking. So the idea is to create that flow, figure out what are all of the varieties of ways that somebody might want to interact with that skill, and, and script it out, and really write, write that full dialogue. And that's something that we, we help clients with. The, you know, the, the next big part of that body of work is, is, is then the tech planning. You know, what, how do you accomplish this? What are the skill sets of people that are needed to run something like this. And in our world, that's usually a project manager. Um, it, it, sometimes it's a designer if there's a, a visual component to the app. And, and then there's the developers, both front end and back end developers to help execute. So it's doing some of that planning. That's the ideation. In terms of design, the, you know, this is when you get into the nitty gritty of, of what exactly is going to be said and how will it work. So there's, there's a lot to be said about thinking through the nuances of how somebody is going to uh, invocate, as they call it, a skill. So what is it that's going to be said so that Alexa or any other device knows that you're, you're looking for that particular skill? So there's, there's that to worry about. How do you do that? What is that phrase? What are the variations of that phrase? But then also very important is all of the variety of different ways that somebody could then interact with that skill. So there's plenty of different ways to say certain things. You know, with Howl, it's a matter of thinking through, okay, you're in an emergency, somebody's quite stressed out, how are you gonna capture all of the different ways that they could interact with, with that app and all the different things they could say or do? Um, and so it's incredibly complex in thinking through all of that variety and how people, how people speak and interact. So the, the act of design is, is all of that nuance and thinking through the details. Build, measure, learn, and this is the same and honestly, this, this series of, of slides is the same for, for even mobile apps or TV apps or any kind of app. I mean, ideate, you're going to design it, and then you're going to build, measure, learn. The important part here is, is really the measurement and learning, right? The idea is you're not going to build something perfectly out the gate, and nor should you even want to necessarily. You want to get something out there and in market, in use, so that people can try it out, give you feedback, so that you're not overbuilding and not building more than you need to. Uh, but instead, get feedback, build some more, measure it, learn some more, and then go back and continue to uh, evolve, your, evolve your app, whether it be mobile or, uh, or a voice-driven app. The, the process generally concludes in this, in this space in terms of getting a skill into the, the Amazon Echo Alexa store is, is submitting to the skill to, to Amazon for, for review. Now that's a process that exists now for, for the Google, uh, Google Play and the iTunes store on the app side of the house, the mobile app side of the house. But in this case, you know, it's still a new market. So the, the review process is, is quite cumbersome still with, with Amazon and the Alexa. They're still f figuring out the kinks. How do you get an efficient way of getting an app through the review process? So we're, we're working through that right now with, with Howl. Uh, 
there's some tricky, tricky logistics and some legal concerns that we have to work through with, with Amazon that nobody knew, right? It's all, it's all again greenfield, as Bobby said. So we're sort of learning the rules and figuring out what's happening along the way with them. So that's the process. Bobby's going to talk a little bit about challenges. All right. <clears throat> so it's not all rainbows and butterflies when it comes to voice interfaces. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a big asterisk on a, on a lot of what I'm saying in terms of accuracy and the usefulness of voice uh, interfaces. One of the big ones is that they're very, very language specific. So with a, you know, a traditional piece of software, a mobile app or a website, if you want to localize it to a different language, it's really not all that hard. You take, the, you take the strings, you get somebody to translate them, and then you drop them back in, and boom, you've got a different language. Um, for voice-driven interfaces, they're very much tied to certain languages. So um, take the Amazon Echo. It's only supported in English and German. So if you want to build a skill that's going to understand Chinese or understand you know, Hindi or anything else, you know, you're out of luck. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so for every new language you want to support, you're potentially having to rewrite the entire app. So the, the Prompt Smart guys, you know, we built that app for English. They're like, hey, we want to do it for Spanish. That's an entirely new uh, app that needs to be built because the, the engine that powers the English recognition isn't the same that does Spanish. And a, lot, and a lot of the interactions and logic on top of it change because sentence structure, grammar, the whole, the whole meaning of communication changes with the language. So uh, if, you're, if you're trying to do something that reaches across boundaries, that reaches multi-languages, it starts to become very uh, complex and expensive. Next slide, please. You go ahead. So is there, like, currently there's no, let's say, like, easy way to get around that, for example, like to somehow integrate Google Translate or whatever? So is, is that not common yet, or do you see that coming? For like a, a, a skill? No, not, not really. Like, it, Amazon has to support it because the way it works, again, is that Amazon does the recognition. It's their, their software that's going to take the voice and figure it out. Um, so if they don't support it, it's a non-starter. Um, you have to pretty much build everything from scratch. Uh, and you really don't want to start doing that. Um, so yeah, we're, you're dependent on, and I'm, I'm surprised it's only, it's kind of weird, German and English uh, are the only two languages uh, that Amazon supports, but that's, that's the truth. And, that's what you have to go with for uh, right now. Next slide, please. Another, uh, another interesting uh, uh, implication of voice-driven interfaces is uh, accents. That uh, depending on the way you speak and how you speak to the device, the accuracy moves up and down. Um, and this has a lot of implications uh, in terms of both just actually building the thing, uh, but more importantly, testing it. Um, one of the things we found out with Prompt Smart was that you know, it worked fine for me when I was speaking, but, you know, one of my developers is Indian, so he speaks English with, a, like, an Indian accent. And the accuracy plummets for him. Uh, and, you know, there's no difference in the code. The code's the same. You know, the, we're reading the same transcript, but, you know, suddenly it's not working well for him. It's working well for me. You know, somebody with a, a Texas accent, it might not work as well either. Uh, and so that's actually one of the limitations is that, you know, you need to think about who the audience is. Um, for whatever it is that you're building and make sure that the recognition engine or whatever you're using for voice recognition is actually tuned uh, to that accent, is able to handle that. Um, the big nightmare that comes from this is, is QA, is, uh, is testing, is that you, know, you start seeing things that, you know, me as a developer, I don't know if this is an actual bug in our logic or if it's just the way this person's speaking um, to the device. Uh, and so I feel like this problem really hasn't been solved yet. And so that 99% accuracy rate that I mentioned before is generally with somebody who's speaking in a somewhat neutral accent um, to the device. It's, it's not, it's not going to do well with, with hard accents. Next slide. Building off the, the next one is uh, background noise. Environmental factors start to really degrade the quality of voice recognition. So if, you're building some, if, you, if you speak to your Alexa and there's a screaming baby behind you, it's not going to do very well. Um, you try to use Prompt Smart, and you're in a place with like a very loud air conditioner or like a loud ceiling fan, it's going to start throwing fits. Um, we haven't got to the point yet where we're able to really build things that are totally reliable in very noisy environments, places with a lot of ambient noise, or things that could muffle um, listening to my voice. So, go ahead. Talks 
a little bit loud. Sometimes it starts up. All right. And it gives answers to something. You're sitting on the couch and then someone says, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger is 58. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's, an, that's a great comment. Um, Right. I mean, there was the one problem where there was thousands of orderings. Yeah, in San Diego. Yeah, in San Diego. And uh, then I was wondering with your emergency app, if the TV is running and suddenly they go out an emergency to respond to the police or something. So that's, a, that's, a good, that's, a great, that's a great point. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the problems with uh, a lot of voice recognition is that if it, if it thinks it's heard something, it's going to start going. And it doesn't authenticate the user at all. There's no real security. Uh, that it's the actual owner doing this. It just starts running. Really? Well, is it just generators with um, voice recognition, or is it another component very important, which is machine learning? So right. Right. The development of apps using voice recognition is also in parallel with the development of machine learning. Yeah. So the exactly. The, uh, the more intelligent the machine gets, the more it's able to take out the main. Right. The main that's, uh, I'm actually going to touch on that in the next slide. Let's, oh, go ahead. Just one more question, because is Google, so how they're advertising Google Home, they're, they're saying that they have the ability to authenticate the voice of each and individual family member. Yeah, they do. That's super, so you're, you're you know, since you guys have done this a lot, it's starting. They're starting to learn, yeah. So Google has a functionality where you can authenticate uh, with the device, where you can say, this is me, this is my voice. This is my wife's voice. You know, only listen to, to us two. So again, with machine learning, with a lot of, uh, a lot of the new uh, devices coming out, they're starting to tackle this problem. Because Amazon is the V1 device. And so Amazon, you know, it was the first in, but they, got, they started discovering all these issues that a lot of now the latecomers are, are picking up on. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge right now is that at the end of the day, you're speaking to a computer. And computers are notoriously dumb. Um, you know, we've, the, the voice recognition problem has been cracked. Meaning you can speak to a computer, and you know what, with 99% accuracy, it can take my voice and give you like a printout of what I said. Um, but at the end of the day, you need something to act on that. Like, and computers are dumb. Like, computers don't know what to do with that unless you tell it what to do. Um, and so people, you know, when I say voice recognition, I'm only talking about one half of the problem, is that the second half is actually you know, driving meaning from it, you know, making intelligent actions upon what is being said. And that is still a very nascent problem. You know, Google's doing a lot with the, the security that they have with authentication. Um, you're gonna start seeing more around machine learning, artificial intelligence to start picking out and providing more context and awareness to what people are saying, but we're still a long way away um, from you being able to walk into your house and say, hey Alexa, it's kinda nippy in here. Why don't you bump up the temperature by a couple of degrees? Like, <laughs> if I did that to Alexa, Alexa would be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You have, to speak, you have to speak to Alexa like a, in a command and control way. Our interactions with these devices are, hey, Alexa, turn on the lights. And if you don't say that, good luck. Alexa's not going to know what to do. Um, and that actually starts playing into you know, how you design the interface itself. Because you know, people want to live in a world where you feel like you're talking to Hal and you can have a conversation, but we don't. Um, so with you know, the Howl app, you know, it's one of those things where we had to figure out kind of what the verbs and what the nouns are going to be and kind of just isolate a few that we think are going to be probably the most common things people might say that aren't too elaborate or, or too, too, too long that they're going to forget it in the heat of the moment. Um, and yeah, so this, this is kind of the, the big thing that we're still waiting to, to get better at. Um, let's say you solve the problem of filtering your voice out so that you can, I don't know, dictate in a New Yorker subway or something mm -hmm. without any problem. Let's say everything works. Um, there is still people are afraid because still it listens all the time. Right. Yeah? And this is something where people say, yeah, if it listens all the time, maybe it stores all the time, or it sends something to Amazon all the time. Yeah. And people, I don't, I don't know. Nobody could answer me the question: What happens with this data? Is this data out there? Is it not? I'm. A, I mean, if they are able to to distinguish my voice from thousands of others, they could know if I'm talking like in a subway, oh, he's currently at the subway. Right. So this is a security issue. It's a huge privacy issue. Yeah. Um, 
the the Amazon, I had a lot, I had a lot of uh, doubts in getting an Echo, primarily for that reason. I'm like, there's this little thing there, and they say, oh no, it's not listening, it only listens for the trigger word, but I'm like, it's sitting there listening for the trigger word, so it is by definition listening. And you don't, and I'm, I'm certain, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Amazon isn't doing anything nefarious with it, um, but who's to say that, you know, somebody's not able to hack into the device and have the device always listening. I remember, I think one of the, the revelations from the Snowden leaks was that the CIA was intercepting Dell hardware before it got to people and putting in uh, back doors into the hardware before it got shipped. I can very easily see, you know, packages of Echoes being intercepted and the Echoes being unlocked or modified in a way that it's sitting there with a, you have a giant microphone in your house and you, who knows what it's t sending to anybody. And so that, that, that's a really, that's, it's always been a concern. You know, I don't think the introduction of voice makes it uh, an order of, order of magnitude worse. We've always had uh, th this concern with mobile devices, with the cloud, that you know, we're constantly tracked. Right? Google Maps is always updating your location to the cloud. There's, if you ever look at the internet traffic going from your phone in, in a proxy, it would shock you, the, the amount of data being sent back and forth when the phone is just sitting there and you're not doing anything with it. Um, so it, it's just a, it, it further reinforce, reinforces the privacy issues that we have. Um, right now with even just the, 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 the phones and the, the, the cloud. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I think one of, the, one of the final challenges here is that with a voice-driven interface, you know, it's very hard to teach the person you know, how to use the thing. Uh, when you're using a, a mobile phone, uh, you, know, you have a lot of visual cues. When you're in an app, you might see a breadcrumb in the, at the top left corner saying, you know, I'm in this menu screen or we can give you a little picture, we can you know, write some text, we can very easily instruct a person from a user experience standpoint how to navigate back and forth. You buy an, uh, you buy an Echo, it's this big black cylinder that sits on your, da on your counter, and you're like, now what? Well, how am I supposed to talk to this thing? What are the supported commands? You know, how do I achieve certain goals? Um, so there's a real user education issue with uh, voice-driven interfaces in that there, it's, no, it's not a very obvious way of teaching somebody how to use it. Um, which has a pretty important implication in the way you design these things. Um, in that, since it's a, you know, you're, most of the time you're talking to a, a black box, you have, no, you have no real visual cue telling you where you are in a process. So if we think about, uh, say, if you're uh, ordering something online, right, and you're on a website, you might see a little progress bar at the top saying you're in step two of three, you know, you're in billing details, and then the next one is checkout. So, you know, you have a very good awareness of your context. Um, with voice-driven inter uh, interfaces, you don't. You yourself have to remember, oh, I, I previously, previously said, you know, add this to my cart. Now I must be on the checkout screen. I need to say, you know, echo buy, buy shopping cart. Um, and that's not obvious at all. That's, you know, that's not a great uh, user experience. And so there's real challenges here. And what that means, I think, from an application design standpoint is you really need to think about very simple um, commands that don't require a lot of interaction uh, back and forth with the actual device because as soon as you have maybe one or two hops uh, between you and the device, people are going to get lost and they're going to have no idea where they are. Um, so this is something with Howl that we struggled with is that you know, initially we had a multi-step you know, uh, interaction with Alexa, but the thing is when you get to that second interaction, you have to you know, consciously remember, hey, I'm on step two and I need to now say the next part to get this thing done. I, right now, yes, but I think it's something that we're gonna, that's gonna easily be solved because again, these devices don't operate in a vacuum. Um, they, they're meshed together, meaning that more often than not, they're connected to your phone some way. And so may, I could see ourselves in a few years or very soon that if you're interacting with Alexa, you're seeing a little notifications or something on your phone telling you, hey, Alexa skill enabled step one. Um, and so we're very, it's very rudimentary now, and that's the thing. It's like the early days of push notifications on the, the iPhone. It's like, it was cool, but it was also kind of not being used in the, the best way or to its full capacity. Um, really? Yeah, in terms of user interaction, what I would expect is like an intelligent conversation. You know, when you, when you are in a restaurant and you want to place an order, it's also not one way, like, I want this pizza with this and this and this and this and this and this, and then it's out there and then it's being processed and you get your pizza. But usually it's an interaction. 
uh, and uh, the, but it has to be an intelligent reply and it has to follow up with it. And right. This is where, where many applications currently fail in, in, in guiding you through this process because it, if it doesn't get the first uh, thing right, maybe it has one question, but then it's, it's out. Right. If, if you don't get this one, then you can start from scratch. Right. And and it's still, yeah, it's very, it's primitive now. And so like that's kind of, this goes back to the, in the machine learning and the, the intelligence aspect is that, you know, the interfaces are very primitive. Like you can, you can do a lot right now with them. Um, but again, you, you could build like, you could build a lot of apps in 2008, but you couldn't build the apps we're doing now in 2008 because it wasn't anywhere near the capability we have today. And I feel it's the same way um, with the skills and with uh, these devices is that, you know, as they're out there and being used, the, the vendors are going to start making the interfaces a little bit more richer so that we can handle cases like that. Because, yeah, I find any time I have a multi-step interaction with, my, with Alexa, I end up frustrated because, like, it, it does not work out. And so, yeah, we go, yeah, it doesn't remember. Right, and it doesn't learn, it doesn't learn from the mistakes. Uh, and so, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I wish, you know, computers were smarter. But I, and I think it's going to be a constant battle. You know, trying to make these things more intelligent. Now, as we all agree probably on that for the end user, there's still a lot of unsatisfactory mm -hmm. experiences. How do you think it in the B2B areas when I think about the uh, reflection environments when human, humans are all the way um, interactive with machines and they need to be trained to do that anyway. So it could be easy to be trained to give certain commands Sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> I, you have a last week. You, you mentioned now examples where the customer, the target, is the end user right. in a daily life. Right. And we have all these limitations we see yesterday. How much you see in a business environment, right. in a production environment, integrated in machines where operators need to be trained anyway right. to run the machine so they could be trained to speak to the machine in a certain way, right. which they wouldn't right. frustrate them that much. No, I think that's a, that's a great point in that maybe the, the innovations are going to be driven from the business side, um, production side, because you have a trained workforce. You're not just giving it to some random guy on the street and say, hey, go nuts. You're, there, there's, a, there's the ability to train somebody, the ability to educate somebody on how to use the equipment. I think a good example um, uh, of that is like with the Google Glass. You know, that came out a few years ago, and like, that kind of just bombed after initial excitement because people didn't know how to use it. They weren't using it in the proper environments in the right context. But now it's... It's now made a comeback now because it's now we're not going to do the consumer thing. We're going to give it to uh, assembly line workers. We're going to give it to people in factories who are able to be taught how to use it properly in the right context. And there, it actually is ra rather useful. Um, and that might, and I assume, I, I'd hope that that's going to drive the innovation to eventually, you know, once, you know, once the technology is matured, that it'll come back to the consumer side again. So I could see the same thing happening um, with the voice devices. Uh, question? Right. This could be a yeah, the, the for for voice, yes, for yeah, definitely for a normal computer, right? Cortana, uh, we talk about Cortana is integrated into Windows 10, meaning that it's it's an interface to the actual normal computer, um, and so you can command your Windows device uh, using Cortana and actually perform commands within the context for somebody who's visually impaired. Uh, you know, not just to having it on a device, but just having it on your normal computer can probably you know extend the usefulness of these devices. Right. That's a, that's a good point. Because um, we look at how we had to build the integration between these devices ourselves. But what we're seeing actually now is a lot of services coming on that are taking this challenge where they're going to be the integration layer um, between a lot of these uh, Internet of Things devices. One of them is uh, Ala Networks. 
Um, they've built a platform as a service pretty much. So think of, does anybody know Parse um, and Firebase? So in the mobile app world, they, they came in and said, hey, we're just going to provide you a back end out of the box. You just build the app. Don't worry about communicating, storing the data. You just have to use our service, and we'll, we'll take care of the rest. And they actually did really well. Um, so now we're starting to see the same types of services coming in for IoT, where they're saying, hey, instead of you learning how to communicate with XYZ devices, you know, drop our SDK into your app. We'll handle that part. You just talk to us. Um, so this is just a natural, I think, evolution of the, the whole environment, is that, you know, again, like we're, we're very early. And so now these types of platform plays are coming out, which are going to make it even more easier to become uh, to build services that leverage voice, that connect to all sorts of devices um, in one shot. Because again, everything we've talked about, you know, the Echo, the Wi-Fi camera, the Nest, they, they exist beyond the individual device. They exist as part of a mesh. Um, and that's what's going to continue to grow, is the ability to, to connect these things and have data move back and forth seamlessly. All right, next slide. I think. Yeah. Back to Zach. So we'll talk a little bit about wh why you should care. So we've talked about what's the landscape look like, uh, what's being built, how do you build it, what are some of the challenges, and now, all in summary, so why, why would you want to? Why do you care about this? What, what's going to mean for you guys uh, from a business perspective? Uh, the one stat that I found interesting: you may have heard of Gartner, which is a technology research company. So Gartner's prediction for the end of this year is that 30% of our interactions with technology will happen through conversations with that technology, so actual voice conversations with technology. 30%, which is a, a staggering number, and I almost don't believe it, but it, it's something that they've, they've put forward. The one, one reason to care is the depth and scale of the markets. So these numbers here are the number of apps currently in the Google Play and the iOS app stores. Right, you've got 2.8 million and 2.26 million in the two stores. And like I said earlier, there's only 15,000 skills in, in the Amazon Alexa Echo store. So it's, it's still a greenfield market. There's still plenty of room to build something really cool that somebody's going to discover, and it could be you know, the, next, the next big app. It's a little bit harder in this space, right? You're going to compete against these 2, two million uh, and more apps to get, to get an audience and get downloads. But in the, in the skills marketplace, in the voice space, it's new. It's new and open. Um, the next reason is, is competition. There's going to be more and more of these devices coming out. Right? These, are, these are the three main devices, but e there's one of them that's not even sold yet. Right? The HomePod on the far left isn't, isn't being sold yet by Apple. The other two are, are out and in existence, but there are, there are other companies out there looking to build more of these devices and two, two, one, two that are the top of the heap in terms of potential for the market is the Samsung, right? They build great phones. They're going to build a great uh, voice device as well. And Bose is, is, is supposedly building something as well and quite a popular speaker company. So competition, right? There's, there's more people entering the market. There's going to be more devices out there. If you can build an architect a skill, you can, in theory, start to build it across these devices. So you don't have to just build for one. You can build for, for multiple, like we did OWL, which is across multiple. The, uh, the next thought is, is around you know, why, why to care is that IoT, generally, all of these Internet of Things devices, they don't have screens. They don't have keyboards. So how are you generally interacting with most of these IoT devices now? It has to be voice. It's, it, it's just a natural evolution. For a while, as Bobby said, you're going to probably have a phone that will interact with that device as well. And you'll be able to do some things on your phone or with a screen. But generally speaking, as more and more Internet of Things devices come out, the natural way to interact with them, whether it be a light bulb, a Nest thermostat, et cetera, it's going to be voice um, by necessity. The, the next is that only now, in the last year or two, uh, is the voice recognition good enough to actually make people care. You know, now that we're at that 99%, you can actually have accurate, meaningful conversations with a device that you couldn't have had a few years ago. So the fact that we're, we're now at that point means that more and more people are going to adopt it. It's still going to be weird to talk to inanimate objects for a while, but people will get more and more used to it, just like they weren't used to necessarily having a phone call in the middle of the street, walking down the sidewalk. People got used to that. All of a sudden, you're going to be talking to your, your devices at home, um, and it will seem quite normal and natural. 
So those are some reasons to think about it. Um, happy to take other questions. We've got another couple minutes. Any questions for us? In the back. Well, a lot of the device, they, like for the, a lot of the dumb IoT devices, they're leveraging the cloud for the recognition component. So they require the so internet connection. That in the well, that's how it's happening right now. So like, there, there's two models. You think of something like Prompt Smart or the Solo app, uh, the recognition is done all on the device. So it's, it's incredibly quick, it's incredibly fast. So it does real time conversations very well. Things like Alexa, Google Home, um, they're dumb devices. They do not have like, much computing power, they rely on the internet connection. Um, and the cloud is what's doing the conversion. Yeah. Right. So, so the uh, are there all alternatives to Amazon's recognition in that there are. Um, if you're building an app, um, there's any number of uh, paid and free recognition engines you can use. Personally. You know, we've had a lot of success with uh, Open Ears, and that's, a, that's, an, iOS, um, that's an iOS recognition framework. Uh, the, it's free at the base level, but you've got to pay for additional functionality. And that's built off of, um, what's the, uh, I can't remember the, the underlying academic recognition engine, but it it's, it's, works extremely well, um, and it's very accessible. So you're not tied to the big vendors to do recognition, especially if you're on a phone. Uh, you can, there, there's any number uh, of options out there. Right there. Um, as this becomes, uh, this technology becomes kind of more and more popular, I think there's some concerns regarding the security. So how do you feel about uh, devices being able to listen to you, let's say, 24 7? Yeah, I'm worried about it. How about you, Zach? <laughs> I, I don't own any of them, um, so I'm, I'm less worried about it. But no, it's absolutely a, a concern, but it, it's, it's one that exists when you carry around your phone too, right? I mean, I can, I can invoke Siri right now by just saying, hello, Siri. Right. That, that fear exists, and you, you carry that device around all the time. Yeah, I feel like we crossed that bridge a long time ago. <laughs> I think we, we surrendered that right. level of privacy way back. So like, we're not, it's not any, like, we're not entering new ground here. It's just like, hey, look. They forbid it? They forbid it, and you have to prove that you destroy it because the Nachrichtenbundesamt, so uh -huh. this is uh, like UCA, said it's actually from the, from the technology. It's declared as a spionage equipment. So if you bought it, you have to show that you destroyed it. If they catch you, 40,000 bucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt that I think one of the reasons I why. I wonder how much. Uh, <laughs> Right. As you said, because the regulators are not there yet, mm -hmm. to be honest. <laughs> right. It's going to depend on the country, too. Clearly, Europe Germany's got a lot stronger uh, laws, laws around Europe generally. privacy in that. In the U.S., it's a, you know, it's, there's, you can do whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> nobody's going to stop you. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so when you develop a skill, Amazon skill, how helpful is Amazon in terms of, let's say, promoting your uh, first floor slash skill? Definitely exists. Uh, it happens. There are, there are ways to to get your skill promoted by by Amazon. It's similar to the way it works with with Apple and Google. It, it it's pretty subjective. It really depends on what who the reviewer is that gets your app and, and sees it and says, "Wow, this is something interesting. This is something I want to promote or showcase in our store." There isn't a whole lot more to it than that. Um, you know, we 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 would like to be able to tell our clients, even in the app side of the space. We can help you get your app 
featured by Apple or Google, and that's, that's an impossible claim. You just never know. You never know. You mean you can, you can build it right, you can build it well, and hopefully that gets recognized as top quality. But short of that, not a whole lot that can be done. Any other questions? All right. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thanks for coming.